No one has better described his condition at this time than the orderly officer. All his strength seemed to have passed from his body to his head. He now recalls all the events of his former life and no longer experiences mental stupor. His memory seems to have recovered and he is continually talking of what is to be done at his death. The will he had just drawn up, written twice in its entirety in his own hand with the exception of estimates drawn up and written by Marchand, a result of profound meditation and the most serious accomplishment of his captivity proved upon an analysis of its provisions to be a most amazing resume of his life, of his infancy and youth, of the men he loved, those he appraised, those he pitied and immortalized because they were sacrificed for his cause and persecuted for having served him. He declared the intensity of his love for the veterans of his armies and for the people whose grandeur was inseparable from his glory, but he also revealed the depth of his heart, a subject of which he never spoke nor allowed anyone else to speak, in which he had constantly childish pictures before his eyes. This was what filled his will, just as it filled the heart of his father, not that he bequeathed the treasures imputed to him, poor treasures indeed, but everything which represented him in concrete form had touched him, which he had worn, which had guarded his perishable form and attested to it the souvenirs he had received from sovereigns, the presents from his mother and sisters, the supreme mark of his command and the representation of his glory. The will related, explained, and commented upon the whole Napoleon. It contained the doctrine he had bestowed upon the French and the opinions he desired they should retain of him. It requires a several-page survey, and the strange incidents which accompanied its execution must also be recorded without any appearance of delight for most serious were the facts which were disclosed. Dates are important in the drawing up of a will. Until the day before his death, Napoleon was in full possession of his faculties and looked upon death with the perfect clarity. He was wont to regard a battlefield, but as life ebbed away and weakness increased, must he not have existed in a sort of dream or spell? The will itself in its first code is still referring wholly to the sums in the Lafitte Fund, the existence of which there was no doubt were dated April 15th, and an additional codicil, the emperor allocated 200 millions from his private estate to his companions in arms and to the inhabitants of the towns, which had suffered most severely from any invasion. He knew the Bourbons would not return what they had taken, but he raised a protest and included the officers and soldiers from whom 1792 until 1815 fought for the glory and independence of the nation and in the towns and villages of Alsace, Lorraine, Franche-Comte, Burgundy, Ile-de-France, Champagne, Ferre, and Dauphiné, therefore associating the France of the Revolution, the blue France, with his sorrows, since it was she with whom he shared his wealth and to whom he turned for justice. That was contained in the political part of the will, and the emperor had no illusion, but upon the immediate efficacy of such a bequest, did he declare in the codicil stated April 24th and 25th from what funds he intended to pay the legacies? from capital which he actually did possess and which he was fairly sure to be able to distribute, he passed on to much less tangible estate. Irrecoverable claims, the recovery of old gifts, and former liberality, and IOUs. But with regard to that which he wanted to leave to his faithful followers, he knew himself to be so poor that he was obliged, at least in imagination to exaggerate that miserable pittance intended for them which he believed constituted his fortune and of which half was known to have been stolen from him and so in the same way he begged souvenirs of himself for his son from those with whom he had been in contact or who had undertaken some duty or task for him so he sought for his soldiers some share of the millions ascribed to Uchen or assumed by Marie-Louise, this share of his wealth was not for his son. 
nor his relatives, but for those who gave him a start and guided him during his youth, for those who made loyal to him in adversity, and for the children of those whose devotion to him had cost them their lives. One cannot believe that he fancied he was disposing of it effectively, but he deluded himself by what appeared to put his mind at rest. Nevertheless, he knew whom to confine himself to, as was evidenced by the manner in which he proceeded and by the grating of his generosity. Actually, he had at St. Helena only the necklace of stones returned by Queen Ortas as a last resource upon leaving Malmaison and little reserve hidden from the English and augmented by various deductions from the funds sent from London. He requested Marchand to bring him the necklace and said he returned it to him. Good Hortense gave it to me, thinking I might need it. I believe it's worth 200,000 francs. Hide it on your purse and I give it to you. I do not know the state of my affairs in Europe, and it is the only thing of value I can dispose of. It will enable you to await the result of my will and codicils. And in this way, he settled the lot of the man who had devotedly and constantly attended him by a personal gift from his own hand. The 300,000 francs he possessed, he shared among his companions according to their rank and to defray the cost of their return journey. There was still some more available money, so as contained in the first code, so he disposed of the six millions he invested upon leaving Paris together. With the interest there on it, 5% since July 1815, he must have thought that this sum would have risen between seven and eight millions, but he actually settled only five million, five hundred thousand francs, and by doing so considered that he would have put the bequest subscribed to this sum of money outside the pale of all possible reduction. He was still in complete possession of his faculties when on the 22nd he signed all the inventories brought to him. The cases and snuff boxes remained to be listed. He asked Marchand for the casket containing them and dictated a list of them. He put aside one box for Lady Holland when adorned with a beautiful cameo, which was given to him by Pius VI after the Treaty of Tolentino. He himself wrote on a card, Napoleon to Lady Holland, a token of esteem and affection, and ordered Count Montsalon to dispatch it, at the same time expressing his gratitude to Lord and Lady Holland. He picked out another box intended for Dr. Arnott, to which Montsalon added 12,000 francs of gold. The box, which was of gold, bore on its lid a long design depicting bunches of grapes around a blank shield. The emperor, while talking to Marchand, said that his initial should have been engraved on it and taken some scissors scratched very badly formed and with their point this autograph and was considered by dr arnott more precious than if it had been executed by the cleverest engraver after the inventory of the snuff boxes the emperor asked marchand for a list of the things deposited with the comte de turin keeper of the wardrobe he disposed of them giving the greater part to his son and dividing the rest between the empress, his mother, Fesh, Eugène, Princess Pauline, the Queen of Naples, Queen Hortense, Jerome, Joseph, and Lucy had commanded that a locket should be made of his hair for every member of his family, a bracelet for the empress, and a watch chain for his son, nothing. And could be more real, more practical than these provisions. He spent the morning the same day in writing his code sills, one of which he bequeathed the two millions left of the funds sent in gold to Empress Marie Louise, his very dear and beloved wife at Orléans in 1814, another in which he dealt with two millions in the hands of Eugène from the liquidation of the Italian civilist. He doubtless considered these four millions as problematical, but he did not think of suggesting any means of payment of the legacies he made, whereupon when he then disposed of 600 and then of 400,000 francs destined for more or less probable fulfillment, he gave these legacies the same value as those in the first code of sell that is to say that failing the resources upon which he was relying, he intended they should be paid from the sums deposited with Lafitte. But was this Lafitte capital sufficient to discharge legacies amounting to six million eight hundred and ten thousand francs? He was so doubtful of it that he reduced his debit of two hundred and twenty five thousand francs on one account and an allowance of twenty thousand francs on another, and so he blended in a most wonderful manner the power of imagination and practical policy which overlooked no detail, weighed up and adapted everything, even provided for the expenses, the administration of such a succession and rule as might be appointed. There was more 
There were the instructions for the executors of the will, dictated all through that morning to Marchand, in which the clarity of the calculations, the preciseness of their terms, the amazing test of memory, the prodigious enumeration of facts in 37 articles, some related for the first time with the decision in order and explicit direction in every case to all whom he appointed to the various tasks.